This is a, uh, a long anticipated um, event because the, the uh, oh, there's a few strike. No, I guess not. Okay. Um, the, uh, some of you have, um, have been this week to the Pacific Symphony and have heard um, the Cathedrals of Sound concert with the uh, world premiere of Fiat Lopes. <laughs> And we are privileged tonight to be able to hear about how things like that happen from the three people who made it happen. So I, want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking. And I, also, I do want to say, if you missed it at the Pacific Symphony, you may go to Christ Cathedral in Orange, formerly the Crystal Cathedral, for those of you who are older and remember that, um, where the... Where the uh, uh, oratorio will be performed one more time. Um, Eight o'clock, Tuesday night, Christ Cathedral. You've got a chance. So, Sir James McMillan is someone we met through a friend and got to know him through the Come Knock Trist, which is a music festival that he founded in his hometown of Come Knock, Scotland, which is a depressed coal town, and, and one in which the former Prince of Wales, now the King of England, um, invested and re did restoration work and job creation. Um, but it is also one that James and his wife Lynn uh, have invested, creating a rather remarkable music festival. We got involved with the festival and got to know James and Lynn. And um, let me tell you, the first weekend in October, you really ought to plan sometime to go to the Come Not Trist. James became onto the, came onto the music stage with his acclaimed BBC proms premiere of the Confession of Isabel Gowdy in 1990, long before we met him. His music combines rhythmic excitement, raw emotional power, and spiritual meditation. His works have been performed by hundreds of, hundreds of times by orchestras all over the world, including the Lum London Symphony, the Royal Concert Gabot in Amsterdam, New York, Los Angeles, St. Petersburg, I think in China. I could go on and on and on. Um, it's a, it's, he was made a knight in 2015, and then his life really came together in 2016 when he met us. So that was, <laughs> right? Our life came together then, anyway. Um, so, James. Carl St. Clair, how can I begin? Uh, we met Carl St. Clair long ago, actually, when Carl was new to the Pacific Symphony, and the Pacific Symphony was not what it is today, because Carl came. And long ago, we helped Carl um, start the uh, Class Act program in the early 90s, and it is now, I, John Forsyth told me that 400,000 students, have I got that right? I saw John somewhere. Is that, well, in the front, of course. That's, is that right? 400,000 students in middle school and, and high school, elementary and middle schools in Orange County have participated in the Glass Act program, where they get to spend a year. working with a musician from the Pacific Symphony. Carl has, he is now one of the longest tenured, it seems like I just met you, Carl, and now, um, conductors of major American orchestras. He has been 33 years at the Pacific Symphony, which means I've known you almost that long. He's widely recognized for his musically distinguished performances and his commitment to building outstanding educational programs. Class Act is but one here in Orange County. There are many others. And, and also there's heartstrings, and there's, it goes on and on what this wonderful symphony has done. And um, in, in April 2018, Carl led the Pacific Symphony to his sold out Carnegie Hall debut. And then in May, because you had nothing else to do, he led the symphony on its first tour to China. And in June of 2018, the orchestra made its national PBS debut on great performances. So good, it was before 2020. Good timing, it was excellent. 
And from 2008 to 10, Carl was the general music director for the Komisch Opera in Berlin. And in 2014, he became the music director of the National Symphony in, in Costa Rica. His international career includes leading the Boston Symphony, New York Philharmonic, Philadelphia Orchestra, LA Philharmonic, and San Francisco, Seattle, Detroit, Atlanta, Houston, Indianapolis, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver symphonies. I could go on and on, obviously. So it's great to have Carl here. And we have worked with Carl. We got Carl. You know, one of the places you don't mention is Perry, Iowa. I'm really shocked. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Yeah, okay, okay, it's my fault, or Anne, Anne, it's Anne's fault. She put this together. No, Carl, <laughs> we uh, in, um, invade upon, well, Dana has been to Perry, Iowa, too. I mean, we did a project in my hometown, and Carl came and directed the, uh, the Des Moines Community Orchestra um, in, in Perry, Iowa, which is, was, it was wonderful if you were from Perry, Iowa. 7,000 population, anyway. Um, but um, we've also done a number of other things that we've worked together on over the years, including, which I forgot, on the uh, film, um, a, a premiere at the Village of Hope here in Orange County right. in 2008. So, um, Carl, and last but far from least, but you know this person. Uh, many of you know Dana Joya because he's been here more than once and entertained us and, and, um, and, and caused us to be thoughtful with his poetry. The most recent time was with Helen Sue. Dana Joya, who I met because I listened to an interview with him on Mars Hill Audio, which some of you know, in 2020, I think, and I called him up and talked to him because we were doing salons. And uh, we talked for a couple hours and solved the problems of the world, but no one took notes. So that's why we're in the shape we're in. At any rate, um, since then, Dana, Dana has been, he, he worked in, uh, in business for 15 years and then decided he would risk everything and be a freelance writer and poet. I'm looking at his wife who's, yes, yeah, still here. Anyway, um, and, and it worked. He wrote a very important essay, Can Poetry Matter? which caused a great stir and uh, continues to. Dana has, has been the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts and poet laureate of this state of California. He comes from Mexican and Italian background and grew up in Los Angeles, in Hawthorne to be specific. He was the first person in his family to attend college and he did it royally because he got not only a BA but an MBA and an MA, no MFA, that's the crucial thing. And um, he's published six books of poetry and five collections of critical essays and his anthologies are among the best-selling textbooks in the country. I don't think I need to talk anymore, but I wanted you to know how special these three men that we have with us tonight are. And it's a great honor to me to know them. It's a great honor to us that they decided to collaborate, and it's a great gift to the world that they did. And so, Sir James, Carl, and Dana, please come up and tell us how you did it. So, what an honor to be here with these two incredible artists. Um, so I'm going to start out with a question and then just let you talk for a while. Mm -hmm. I, I had the great honor of studying and being a friend of, and, a, and he was my mentor to Leonard Bernstein. And one of the things he says is that composers and artists have this special key, this key that unlocks a part of the spheres or the universe or the realm or the Imperium, the heavens, where certain sounds and Dana and your word and your and your world, certain words exist 
But not everybody has one of those keys. Some people don't even know how they got those keys. They just find out that they have them. I'm one of those people. I grew up in a town of 36 people. I didn't hear a symphony orchestra until I was 17 years old, until I, and I was playing in it. So music <laughs> and these types of things that we're talking about, they, they might sound a little subjective, mysterious, mystic. But this thing called talent and art and these keys that were given, we didn't seek them. Oh, we were. We work hard. We study. We groom them. We develop them. We nourish them. But to both of you, when did you first realize that you have, because you do have, I mean, we all know that, that uniquely special key that opens a part of the realm where these beautiful things, words, music, notes, sounds, phrases, live, that you have the right to go there and you alone, along with people like you, can bring them back so that we mere mortals can, <laughs> can partake of them. <laughs> that's an easy, that's the easy question. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know if I, I, I have realized that, uh, that I've got that key yet. I'm still working on it, Carol. <laughs> However, um, something did happen very early on in, in my life. And it was, uh, it's not the seismic moment that it is for most British school children aged eight, but I was given a little plastic recorder at uh, elementary school. And uh, that was the beginning of a life in music. But I knew immediately, probably even the within days that I wanted to write music. I didn't know what that meant at the time and how, what that would mean later, but both my mother and my grandfather uh, loved music and talked to me about the uh, um, great key holders of the past, uh, <laughs> whether it be Beethoven or Haydn, Mozart and so on. And I remember these little ladybird books of the great composers that British school children had way back then. And, I, I loved these stories, and I, I, I was intrigued with the, the life stories of Beethoven, and that the, they were quite strange people, as well as uh, um, visionary artists. Um, and I had a feeling that I, I, I wanted to do something similar, um, but as I say, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and the, the, rest, the, rest of the rest of my life has been a journey to find it, I suppose. Because, you know, we hear Stravinsky say, I'm just the vessel. When he wrote La Sacre du Printemps, I mean, Rite of Spring, he says, I'm just the vessel with which this comes into the midst of, of, of a people of Earth. But do you feel sometimes that you get ideas and thoughts and feelings and musical notes from places that you can't even explain? I, I think so. I think the, uh, the, any artist composer, for example, has to be open to the possibility of um, sometimes the strangest and unexpected inspirations. Um, and that those inspirations can come from deep within or deep outside, as it were, um, in the lives of other people, uh, in events, uh, in the other arts. Um, and com composers over the years have been inspired by the strangest things. Um, love affairs, dreams, nightmares, um, um, and sometimes an experience of the divine, uh, an experience of uh, a search for the sacred. And I know this has cropped up in a number of our conversations this week on stage uh, and with your, your colleague Alan that, that held the early evening pre-concert talks. And, and we, we I, I've, I've I'm always very keen to point out that I think that composers are involved in a search for the sacred. Uh, and it's a, a, an art form where people who love this music will talk in spiritual terms of their uh, love of music and the way that their lives have been changed by music. Um, and I, I know that many within the world of music will claim 
contested, of course, but especially by a poet, perhaps, that music <laughs> is the most spiritual of the arts. I know that there are many poets will uh, say that poetry is, is the most spiritual of the arts, but, and that's a, a debate to be had, of course. But I certainly recognise in the world of poetry uh, that, that the great poets, even in modernity, even in our own time, the 20th and now the 21st centuries, have, in significant and in diverse ways, um, uh, probed the, 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 a sense of the numinous. And I think composers have done that through the centuries, and baffling to, bafflingly to some, uh, it's the 20th and 21st centuries where we find it at its most acute and most searching. You've mentioned Stravinsky, uh, one of the great founding fathers of, of early modernism in the early 20th century, but he was a man of faith, uh, a man who set the mass, uh, who set the psalms, who set little prayers like the Ave Maria, uh, and the, the Pater Noster, as I say, a man of faith. And um, that other <coughs> great uh, composer, uh, uh, the other great polar opposite, as it were, at the beginning of modernism, Arnold Schoenberg, who came to this part of the country in the 1930s, he, he converted or reconverted to a practicing Ju Judaism after he left Germany, and his later music is infused with not just his Jewish spirit, but a, a Jewish theology, uh, a Jewish character. Uh, and we could go on, Olivier Messiaen, Francis Poulenc, Arvo Perk, who's still alive, a whole screed of composers who came after Shostakovich from behind what was the Iron Curtain, all deeply religious and spiritual people. Uh, even the likes of John Cage, for example, ch chose to study with Sch Schoenberg. Why did he choose Schoenberg as a teacher? Uh, well, he saw in Schoenberg a fellow mystic. He saw a fellow composer obsessed with silence. Um, that, and he, and the, the realization that there is an umbilical link between silence and music. It's in the silence, the deep silence of the uh, of the heart and soul uh, of a composer that the sounds begin uh, paradoxically. It's in that silence that music emerges. Schoenberg knew that. I'm sure Beethoven knew that uh, in centuries gone by. Great composers have always valued silence. You can hear silences in, in, in the great works of art. John Cage, of course, famously pursued silence in, in some of his provocations to our listening culture. So right across the board, in our time, in my time, the 20th and now 21st centuries, I feel as if I've been surrounded by composers of earlier generations and in the present generation who see the search for the sacred as a valid avenue for the living composer. Dana, um, I know that I am, that the, or, that the organs of my soul are my ears. Now you can debate, as you were saying, some people say that eyes are the organ of the mind, ears are the organ of the soul. And I don't know that that's true for everyone, but I can say that it is true for me. And I tell you how I found this out. It was four years ago when for the very first time, I didn't read poetry that I was looking at and reading. I literally heard a great poet speaking, reciting, singing, if you will, their poetry. And it went from their heart, their creation, to my ears. And I've never been so moved than in the living room of your home when I heard Dana Joya, the very first time I actually heard a real poet read their poetry, change my life. Dana, oh. I, want, I want to kind of pose the same question, but, in, but couch it in ways that are more appropriate to. Well, I think it's. Uh, I don't remember where it is in F. Scott Fitzgerald, but there's one moment where they're in a bar or something, and they meet this old friend of theirs who is very wealthy, but now he's broke. And they ask him, how did you go bankrupt? And he goes, it happened very slowly, then all at once. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> that's sort of my career in the arts, I think, you know, uh, in terms of it happened very slowly. Uh, my mother used to recite poems. She's a working class Mexican woman, but she, and she had to memorize poems uh, in what was then called grammar school. And, she, and we would, when we were doing chores, she would just recite them. And, and, and I didn't understand when I was a kid that they gave her words to talk about sorrows in her life that she lacked her own words to express. 
And I think that that, you know, now as an old man, I see that that's one of the powers of poetry is giving us words strong enough to articulate and bear these, the, the reality and the, uh, and the pains and joys of living. And so I grew this, and she also, uh, my uncle, who is a, uh, a working class intellectual merchant marine, he was a, the secretary of the California Communist Party, but then, then uh, uh, got mad at the party and, bec and became a Catholic. Uh, <laughs> uh, and he was brilliant, he taught himself five languages, and when he was on land, he would stay with us. And so our little apartment was full of his books and records, and so then he was killed in a plane crash. And uh, so we had all these things around that my parents didn't want to throw. They, was, they kept it not because they wanted to read the novels of Thomas Mann or, or Goethe in German, but out of a kind of family piety. And one of the things they had were, were records. And I remember Dina Lupati's uh, recording of Chopin's Preludes. It was a very early LP. And I would put it on, and I would listen to Chopin. There was an old recording of... Uh, the, the, the Fliegender Hollander, and I, I'd never been to an opera, I didn't know German, but I would, you know, there's nothing to do when I was a kid, so anything, you know, uh, uh, anything, you, you know, so I'd listen to these records, and certain records had this power, as poetry did, to bring me into a different state of consciousness. When my mother recited these things, I, I was not experiencing life in the kind of ordinary way I did, but it was under the power of an enchantment. And I knew, it's sort of like what Jimmy's saying about the recorder, I knew it once. I don't want to live in Hawthorne. You know, I wanted to live in Chopin. You know, I wanted to live in Edgar Allan Poe. You know, I wanted to live in Shakespeare. Now, I'd never seen a play, I'd never been to a concert. But it was, the, I, you know, and I think some of us have a more susceptibility. I think everyone likes art, everyone likes music, but some people are tremendously vulnerable to it. It's like an, a lifelong addiction starts with the first fix. And so growing up, I was always looking for somewhere to put this, but I didn't know a single adult that had gone to college. Uh, and people worked in basically manual labor, you know, in my family. And so I started doing, learning the only art that they instruct poor kids in, which is music. And so I took piano lessons from the sisters. I started learning woodwinds. And I was in love with the music. You know, I, I thought I wanted to be a composer. And that, I wanted, and, but once again, I had no idea what that meant. But I wanted to, you know, be, but I was listening to Vaughn Williams and Britton and Tippett and Copeland and Barber, these living, Stravinsky, who's living in Los Angeles, you know. Uh, you know the, and I'm just so used And I go to college. I start as a music major at Stanford. Terrible place to go to study music. Uh, <laughs> Terrible place to go to study almost anything, I, I think, except, <laughs> except engineering. Um, and my professors are all German serialists or American electronic composers. And they go, Britain? Oh. And I remember my, my German you know, professor, I said, you know, who do you, and he goes, first of all, they didn't like the fact that I had knew something about contemporary music. That offended them deeply. Because that, you know, clearly, I, you know, I was going to bring in, and I said, "Well, I like Britain, Tippett, Copeland, Barber," and he goes, "Britain, Copeland, Barber, quatsch," you know, <laughs> you know, nonsense. This is crap, you know, and you know, Boulez, you know, uh, you know, it is what you want. You know, the Darmstadt project was where it was at, <laughs> and so I, I was so depressed at Stanford, my sophomore year. Uh, also, because I was, you know, you know, I was un had an unhappy romantic attachment. I went off to Vienna to study music, and because uh, my I discovered that my California scholarship would apply to it, so I suddenly I'm in Vienna wanting to be a composer. I'm living in a student house full of music students, and you know, after about 15 minutes, I say, I just don't have the level of talent these guys do, you know, uh, uh, you know, I. It just wasn't there, and I was reading German, and I was, uh, I always read poetry, and then I'm writing a little bit of poetry, and, and literally, it's like the guy going back all at once. I literally, I don't know if I woke up, or just in the middle of one day, I understood, I understood irrevocably that I was going to be a poet. I had no idea. It was like saying, this is what you'll do with your life, figure out what it means. And I came back, you know, I realized I was going to be a poet, and then I realized I had to lead my life differently. And, 
you know, every decision I've made since then, even getting a job in business was, in a sense, to, to protect, to create a space where I could protect what that being a poet meant. And that's when the craft is. That's when you realize, you know, I don't know how to do this. I've got to learn from the ground up. But it, it, it always it had nothing to do with school. It had nothing to do, I think, I think being a poet is a slightly embarrassing thing. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it really is. You know, it's, you know, it's very sacred, but you know, it's, it's, you know, it's in our society, it doesn't really fit into anything, but it never bothered me. It was just, this is what it was. It struck me as a vocation of inestimable value. My only problem was to be worthy of the vocation. And uh, that's what I did. And I've always been led, uh, it's the muse comes and goes as she wants. Uh, she prefers younger men, uh, you know, but she knows I can show her a good time. Uh, you know, so she shows up every now and then. And she's a source of joy. And it, you know, and it, it's, you know, it's give, you know. Now, I wanna say one other thing, which bring me up maybe back to this. I do not, I believe that poetry and song are the same art. Uh, it's like rootstock that is two different branches, but everything that I try to do in a poem is what you, one would do in a song. Now, instrumental music is a little different because it's probably more related to dance uh, and the, the nonverbal physical feelings we have. But I realized that my entire preparation in music was the best training I could have had a po as a poet because it's all necessary things that nobody tells poets about these days. I hope you realize, it, in listening to these comments, what did, what did he just say? I hope I'm worthy. What did James say? I'm still developing. I'm still working. I'm still looking. I'm still searching. I'm still trying. This is what makes greatness, right here. I thank you for all the kind comments you said about my conducting and about me as a music director. A few years ago, well, every year from Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving, I ponder a single question for a whole year. And I won't tell you what those questions are, but I can guarantee you they're not true and false. <laughs> they're not yes or no. They're not a multiple choice. They are very complex. And one of the questions I had one year was, what gives me or who gives me the right to stand in front of people and make a non verbal gesture eliciting, and at the time I, in my whole life I've also been a professor, what has given, what gives me that right? So I asked 50 professional musicians from the Metropolitan or Opera Orchestra, the New York Philharmonic, the LA Philharmonic, the orchestras that, where I knew, and I said, I want three words that you would consider the most important assets of a great conductor. And there was one word that all 50 people that I asked used. Can you guess what that might be? Huh? Humility. That was among them, off used, and very connected to the real word, which is honesty. Uh. Honesty of purpose. So this brings me back to the both of you. Because when I conduct, <laughs> this is the first piece of yours that I've conducted, though very quickly, as soon as I can find an opportunity, you know, seven less words from the cross will be definitely my next work of yours that I, I want to conduct. Um, what is it that gives me, when I, hear you, when I hear you recite your poetry, Dana, and when I conduct, when I looked at the score, even in moments later, I realized there is incredible integrity, incredible honesty in this music that I'm looking at and hearing in my, in my head. Where and how does this sense of honesty, is it from your working class background? Is it from the, your life path? Is it from the struggles, from the successes? Where does this honesty, because I can name you several composers where, I can't name you several poets because I don't know them well enough personally, no. where, where honesty would come into question honesty of why that note is there, why this note is there. But with your music, James, I know why that note's there. I mean, even in, in our rehearsal with the two soloists, I mean, that E natural in that one triplet that the soprano sings, I go, that's a, 
Where did that come from? Why, that, why is that F sharp there? Why is the raised fourth? Why is it a Lydian mode? I mean, sorry, that we're just talking jargon here. But the point of it is I recognize that this, there's a reason for it. And when I ask him what the reason is, there's, a, there's an immediate answer that has real integrity to it. So talk about integrity in art. Well, I, I do think uh, I, I have the ability to um, account for where the honesty comes from. I, I, it's, I'm intrigued as to what you say. And, and composers, I think, um, hope that that honesty emerges um, over time. And um, when one is training to be a composer, um, you, you have to follow <clears throat> set patterns to begin with. You have to um, imitate the masters. Pastiche exercises are actually very important uh, to a fledgling composer. Your harmony and counterpoint exercises at high school and college are vital. Including writing responses for your church? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, writing music for, uh, I call it Gebrauch's music, music for the non-specialist is, is just as important. I think composers have got to be um, useful for their community as well as seeking something uh, of the integrity and honesty as well in, in, the, in the, the artistic utterances as well. I think it's something that grows perhaps over years. Um, when, I, when, I study, when I studied as a composer, it was technical things that mattered most. My teachers never talked to me about these things, the kind of things we're talking about just now. It was like, why is this note there? Why is it that note and not this note? Um, um, how do you account for the structure being that length? What, why are the proportions this length? Um, do you agree that the proportions are working? If no, why not? Um, so it's very technical parameters that are discussed by any young composer training to be a composer. And one hopes, I suppose, that over time an individual voice will emerge. But that's not a given. Uh, no, no, one, no one knows if that will happen, when that will happen. And it's not for the composer to decide whether it's happened. It's for others to decide. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a blessing to hear and to read um, accounts of one's music where an assessment is being made according to uh, principles of honesty and integrity. Uh, it, it's wonderful if that is, is coming through. But it's something that happens almost by accident, by osmosis, and almost subliminally over time. Well, yeah, uh, years ago, and this is not a creative uh, context, but a critical one, I'd written a piece, and I made a statement that this one poem, poem by Anthony Hecht called Venetian's Vespers, I thought was the best long poem, uh, you know, the, you know, the last 10 years in America. You know, and this one person came to me outraged and said, what gives you the right to say that? You know, because I think he assumed that there was some infallible academy somewhere that would rank these things. And I said, what gave me the right is I made my case, I put it in public, and I allow anybody to criticize it. Uh, you know, and so it's, you know, what gives you the right as an author? To a certain degree, it's the innocence uh, to go in front of the public and and, and uh, share what it is, knowing that it might not please people. People might dislike it. And so there's a, a vulnerability. Uh, and going back to that odd little reference of the review, uh, in art, uh, no matter if at what level you are, it's ultimately a matter of somebody speaking to you as an individual. We perceive all arts as an individual, even if it's a communal choral piece, the, the audience is made up of individuals. And there's something essential about an art that is one, indiv one person who's describing in music or painting or poetry what it is like to exist in this world, in a human body, in a human context, facing mortality with you know, we hope the, you know, the, the, the possibilities of eternity, talking to, to somebody else who is per, on the same journey, maybe in a different stage. And it's that, that the, the fragility and the delicacy uh, of the one person talking 
honestly and intimately to another person. But every artist I know has lots of people telling them what to say, how to say it, what not to say, and everything else. And I think a lot of people filter out that which is most interesting about their individual sensibility when they're putting it in. They're trying to put it in more and more conventional forms. Now, obviously, you have to learn all the technique and things like this, but you know, I think it's about becoming sophisticated, learning technique, learning the tradition, uh, understanding what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, but not changing the relatively vulnerable, innocent kid inside you which is the human experience that other people are most likely uh, to share. And it's, you know, and it's hard to do because everybody's telling you, no, you should do it this way, you can't say that, you can't say this. And so I've had experiences where I had a poem and I wrote it and I said, I don't even know what to do with this and I won't even publish it. Uh, uh, but, and then somebody sees it and that ends up becoming my most popular poem uh, because it's, you know, it's just something that doesn't fit into the, you know, to the, the context. And so, and I think, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, James, I don't, I don't put words in your mouth, but I think as Catholics, you know, there's a lot that we're supposed to filter out in the arts world. And as Christians, there's a lot we're supposed to filter out in the world, but yet that's essentially you know, part of us. And if we, uh, if we can't articulate our own spirit, our own sense of ourselves and our sense of, of reality, then what are we left with? We're left with, with, with borrowed ideas, borrowed forms, borrowed sentiments. You know, I asked James this question, standing right over there, I said, because many of your works have strong religious and, and religious content in the text, <clears throat> or even in the subtext, are there countries and are there places and are there people that, where your music is less welcomed? I wouldn't say countries. Uh, people, yes. <laughs> um, and... Uh, However, it has to be said, before I <clears throat> get into that, it has to be said that there is something about music um, that makes people much more tolerant of each other. And it's because it's a universal language, and it's because through our shared love of music, uh, the believer and the skeptic will come together. And I find a lot of um, non-religious, skeptical, agnostic, atheistic uh, uh, people who love music will use terms like music the most spiritual of the arts. And when they talk about the spirituality of the art form they love, they're obviously, they obviously mean something by that. And I think it's that shared sensation, that shared suspicion that we have that there is something very, very deep about this art form that is transformative. It's, a, it's an art form that can change lives, that can enter into the crevices of the individual soul and bring about change. And, and that requires an openness, it requires a, a tolerance, it requires a humility. It requires an obedience of listening. Um, one has to give up our precious time to listen to music because it's in the acknowledgement of that sacrifice of time that we know that we can be changed. It's something that we give up in order to become transformed. And, and that points to uh, a deep spiritual and I would say religious resonance in the world of music. So it's not from fellow musicians and fellow music lovers I tend to encounter resistance. Uh, have I had bad reviews? Yes. Have I had bad reviews because of the religious element? Definitely. Uh, and it's something to do with uh, sometimes an ideological <coughs> prejudice uh, that sometimes can appear in, in certain newspapers and, and from certain perspectives. Um, and, and there's a deep snobbery sometimes associated with classical music, as we know, uh, which is a, a great pity. And, and sometimes that snobbery uh, comes down to these matters, uh, as well as matters of social class. Thank you. Can we bring it down out of the clouds a, a little bit to like the work day? I mean, you might not know this, but the other day we had some interviews and it went over several hours. Both Howard and Roberta were there. I was there. These two gentlemen were there. And I remember Dana saying, oh, great, that gives me another two hours to work on. I forget what you said you were working, to put some final touches on this. And then somebody's playing piano in the room next to me. And I go, who's that playing piano? Oh, that's James. He's composing. <laughs> <laughs> so. This just lets you know the work ethic of these two gentlemen, that it never stops. I mean, 
So when you sit down at a piano or when you sit down at a writing desk or when you're taking a, a walk or however it is that you gather ideas, give us a little bit of insight into your work day, into your, your routine. You want, you want me to answer this? Sure. Well, I, I, and this, the, the, the poet, the great poet Rilke, if you know, the greatest modern poet of the German language, early on got a job as the secretary for uh, Auguste Rodin, the sculpture. And because he wanted, to, he wanted to go and work for a great artist, so he went to Paris and, you know, he, uh, he finally got fired because he would invent things in Rodin's letters, you know, because Rodin would just would say, yes, no, you know. But Rodin, he asked him to do advice, and Rod, Rodin's advice was, il fait toujours travailler. That what an artist does, you must always work. Uh, and so I, the thing is that at some level, you know, you've, you've got to, you know, you've got to take everything in your life and, you know, let it, uh, seep in the imagination and you know and you've got to you know let lots of, of empty space in your life and then you work I mean if a typical day for me takes one for, two forms either I sit down and I just start working and I'm working on it or I can't work so I go to, to my there I clean my desk uh, and then I put some things away and then I answer a note and I sit down I can't work and uh, you know this, and then it's lunchtime. Um, you know, so and so I, you know, I make a, make a big lunch, and then you know, uh, uh, you know, maybe listen to the news for five minutes, and I go, oh, I got to get back to this. I sit and work, and I, I can't work, and it's now maybe two o'clock, two thirty, and I realize I've never had any talent. You know, I don't know why I think I should be a writer. I mean, look, I can't even do this. God, I made this terrible mistake in my life. I, I love this art and I'm not worthy of it. And it's just, it's terrible. And I begin to steep in a truly Catholic, uh, you know, kind <laughs> of, of self-contempt about being unworthy of your own vocation. And I begin to hate myself. And I, why shouldn't I kill myself? I mean, really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm living it's a this, sin. <laughs> I'm, I'm living this lie. And, and then I start to write. Uh, and then it, I look up and it's about 90 minutes has passed and it's all, and I've got something done, you know, so if I'm not writing, I've got to somehow descend into some dark, uncontrollable, awful place in my life and just let those things come up or I sit down and I work, you know, uh, that's why it's nice to have a long piece because you can always go back to where, you know, you had it the night before, you know, the night before. But for lyric poems, you know, they tend to be these short, intense things that either come or don't come. You know, I was talking with James and I asked him, because there, there are ways of writing music on a score. I mean, the score I got, you might have seen it on my stand. It's quite, you know, wide and a lot of staves. And there's a system called Sibelius, where composers literally enter something on a computer and it magically appears on a piece of paper, which then gets printed. And, and so the score that I got from James, I think we found, I found maybe, uh, you found one mistake in a note, a, a G natural, which should, be, should have been a G sharp. <laughs> and I, I told him, I said, you, know, you have no idea how long it took to work that G natural into my ear, because G sharp sounded like the note it should be. And then it, it turned out that's what the note he wanted it to be. But I, James doesn't use Sibelius. I said, so how do you compose? He goes, well, the old-fashioned way, you know? So give us a little bit of insight into what that old-fashioned way is. Well, first of all, I'm quite embarrassed that you've discovered that I was using the pi piano to compose. Uh, because uh, <laughs> I tried to tell myself and my students that, that you shouldn't do that. Um, and most of the time, I don't. Most of the time, it is important to hear these sounds in the silence of your imagination, in your own head. And uh, sometimes a piano is more of a hindrance than a help. Yes. Um, it can get in the way. If I'm writing an orchestral piece, as I am this week, uh, I'm writing a concerto for orchestra, the last thing that I want in my mind is the sound of a piano, uh, because I need to hear the orchestra in my imagination. I need to hear the colors of the orchestra. 
Um, and the same with writing for choir. If I'm writing a choral piece, and I've actually brought a choral piece with me as well, which I've more or less completed uh, during this trip, um, the last thing I really wanted to interfere with the sounds of the voices singing Jerusalem Arise, it's for the third Sunday in Advent, was the sound of a piano, because the piano is a very different sound. However, I still like to check my harmony. I like to uh, emerge from the desk, from the silence of my own mind, and just check to see if some of the harmonies worked or not. Most of the time it, is, it has. Sometimes it hasn't, <laughs> and uh, I get annoyed at that, so I have to change things. So that's what I was doing when you overheard me. I, I was sort of It was just a second. It, I didn't really listen for very long, I promise. <laughs> I was surreptitiously checking my harmony. But it, it, it is important. I tell, tell my students this whenever I meet them, that, uh, that the imagination is like a muscle. It has to be trained, and you train it rigorously in silence. Um, and as you know, I was saying earlier about Schoenberg and indeed John Cage, uh, the, the importance of silence for a composer is vital. It's in the silence of our own hearts and minds, our own souls, that the music begins. There's an umbilical link between the silence and the music, paradoxically. Um, so it's important that we rely on the silence to allow, allow the music to emerge and to proliferate and to grow. Um, the uh, uh, and uh, and the, you mentioned Sibelius, this, this system, which is a kind of extension, a more te technological extension of, of the piano in a sense, and that's how younger composers have been using it. Yes, it's, it, it, it brings great advantages. You can self-publish because if, if you, you make your own score electronically, you can publish those scores, and that's a huge advance. But it has this playback system, which I think is, as I say, is more of a hindrance than a help, and it plays back an electronic version, a very synthesized version of your score. And uh, I, I've heard these synthesized versions, and they're not good. And I think the, with the cut and paste facilities, it gives the composer shortcuts to, um, uh, which are not good for the structure of the music. So I, t I tell them, they don't like it, but, and I don't like it as well, uh, tell, having to tell them, but you should try to wean yourself away from both Sibelius, from the electronic media, and the piano. But I'm also very proud to tell them that uh, my only um, concession to modern technology is that I've got an electronic pencil sharpener. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to say something in favor of noise. Um, you know, because my own, you know, the, the practical act of composition, when I was younger, you know, I would sit, you know, you know, I would write and I would speak to my, you know, say it aloud and write. But now, about, 25 years ago, I, I be, began essentially composing my poems in the air. You know, I'll, I'll just walk and I'll, if I have an idea for a poem, I'll just say it aloud and I'll shape it as, as sound and speech. And then when I get a, a, something I think is good, then I'll write it down. But I like doing it while I'm, uh, I'm walking because I feel it in my, my throat, in my larynx, I can hear it in my ear, and also I'm moving my body with it. So, and I like making poetry physical, you know, because I think it should come out of speech. It should come out of your the, the and I think when a reader reads it, they're going to reproduce it in their own body. And so I think that's you know, so my technology is my body, a, a different kind of score, and their body. You know, it's it's interesting because so many great composers of of which their music you love composed while walking. I mean, I mean we, we can go from Wagner to Beethoven to Mahler to, I mean, just Bruckner especially walking. I mean, just walking because in my, my opinion, the thought process is thinking while driving, thinking while sitting, thinking while walking, thinking while listening. I mean, they're all different processes. And I know that I cannot interpret a score while sitting at the score. In other words, if I look and learn his score, I remember, and he's talked several times now about silence and the importance of silence and sound and their, and their kinship and their, their reliance on one another. You might not realize it, but measure one, measure four, and measure seven of this score is silence. So when I go like this, that's measure one.
Did you hear that music? You could hear. I mean, even those of you that maybe didn't come, I mean, it, it's just, it comes without notice and leaves without notice. It's, it and silence are one continuum. Then comes measure three, then comes measure seven, same thing. And, and so I cannot listen to an MP3 markup of mm. anything. It just drives me nuts. And I, I only go to the piano to study a score when I can't hear something in my head. So like, like James, to check, am I hearing what I'm seeing? That kind of thing. Oftentimes, I wish I was a little better at it, but I, I tend to go to the piano, especially with a modern score. Now, I want to point out something. Did you hear what he used the word harmony? My harmonies. OK, two words. First of all, harmony. Sometimes what we refer to as harmony has to do with Bach, Beethoven, Mozart. He understands that harmony as well. And then he says, my harmonies. How many notes of Beethoven do you actually have to hear before you know it's Beethoven, or Debussy, or Ravel, or Wagner, or Bruckner, or Strauss? I mean, that, whatever that, name that note, or name that tune, or whatever that is, drop the needle. His harmonies, his fingerprint, his, his identification. I told the chorus when we had our first rehearsal, they were sometimes singing notes that were half steps apart, whole steps apart, maybe an augmented third apart, you know, or diminished, diminished. So sometimes it sounds a little, in our world, unharmonious or inharmonious. In his world, that's his harmonies. So as a composer and as a conductor, I have to listen to this music as though it's, I'm listening to his language. It's not a comparison with someone else's language. Because if I try to find Mozart in this piece, I'm not only not finding Mozart, but I'm not finding James Macmillan. I'm losing on all accounts. And I told the chorus, I said, when you're singing a half step with somebody, when I'm a half step away from somebody, you're as close to unison as you can get. Be more loving, not more, not more aggressive. <laughs> Be more beautiful. And it, all of a sudden, I started hearing things and seeing things and, and singing in a way that was like all of a sudden a half step or a cluster, if you will, mm -hmm. of tones could sound beautiful, could make its own harmony. So as you listen to music of our time, poetry of our time, I think we have to understand, as Dana said earlier, there are all these things that we have that are part of our history, part of our journey, part of our knowledge, part of our existence, who we are. But it's not necessarily what we need to be comparing what we're now experiencing. That's a unique experience. How many of you came to the concert? Oh my goodness. So we experience something communally, but we experience something individually completely separate from that. The journey we took had different outcomes. And I think when we approach any art of our time, that we need to keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that you have to stop loving Mozart. I mean, I, I think we all, I mean, he went to Vienna. I mean, we, he's mentioned all the great composers. I too. One last question before we open it up, if you don't mind. I don't consider myself a creative artist. You're a creative artist. You're a creative artist. I'm a recreative artist. This week, my job wasn't to create it. It was to recreate <coughs> your art. So my job would, would be, if I could just sort of paint a different, would be giving birth. I, I, I'm just the doctor. I'm just the OB, you know? I'm just that person. I'm not the person that created that child. And I'm also not the one or ones who are going to dictate the life of that child. But what I can do is to do what I hope that you felt Pacific Symphony, the chorale, and our solos did, was to give it the most healthy, most lifelike birth possible so that the work that you have given us has a 
potentiality of having a life after its performance. What do you learn in this process of being with us this week that you will then take to the, to the next piece that you compose or to the next experience? Mm. Either, by the way, he's also a conductor, not just a composer, or not, not only a composer, com so he conducts as well. Mm. And Dana, the same with you and writing this, this libretto and, and, in, and having this collaboration with all of us. Um, <laughs> what might you take forward? Let me answer first, because I have the smaller position in the answer. Uh, you know, and uh, I, I would actually take one step away from that. I feel uh, in these last you know, three plus years, and certainly in this last week, that I've been part of the creation of a major piece of sacred music. Uh, that a, a ambitious program, an impossibly ambitious program in a lot of ways. I mean, it's a Cecil B. DeMille cast of thousands <laughs> kind of piece that I was able to be, you know, you know, part from the very beginning of creating something that has, and just individual, but also I think kind of symbolic value in our culture, which is a. Uh, a reminder, a statement a, uh, of the centrality of the divine in the creation of art. Uh, now you can say that you know the, the importance of, of music in our worship, the, the spiritual uh, aspirations that we bring to a concert hall, you know which uh, you are so articulate in, in pointing out and I'll tell you, it, it you know it beats any other week I've had lately, uh, <laughs> and, and it's 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 you know it's nice to it's nice in a sense to see your team win the pennant, uh, you know we and I by our team I don't mean the three of us I mean all of us, you know that we have created a community you know uh, fostered by the Amundsens fostered by Pacific Symphony, which uh, in. Uh, encouraged, allowed, and then made this remarkable thing happen. And, and that's something that gives me great joy. And Dana, just you were explaining, because Dana came to the rehearsal, came to Thursday night, Friday night, and last night, was it last, last night's performance. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your, after hearing it and seeing the process, your impressions and how they developed and expanded or deepened. Well, I have to start with a, with a confession, is that I work with a lot of musicians. The first time I hear any piece that I've written the words to, I say, well, gee, that wasn't really how I imagined it. Uh, you know, because, you know, it's, it's my text, and I don't really know how. It, so when I heard the rehearsal, I was sort of hearing what James, I think I'd heard maybe three or four notes of the piece before then. Uh, it had, and also, it was, it was the complexity of the piece for the performers was quite obvious in, in those rehearsals, uh, as we're getting things right. Uh, and then over the next three evenings, each night the, uh, the performance and with it the experience of the piece became stronger and clearer and better. And so last night I think there was uh, this sense of this piece from the, mo the first moment of silence to the last measure a sense of inevitable momentum and unfolding, uh, you know, of an of a true work of art, and uh, and it occurred to me this morning that uh, when I'm thinking of my poem now, I can only think of it in James's setting. My words have, in a sense, been you know have been transformed into this work. I mean, I think of the lines, and I think of the the rhythm that he put to it, the the notes that he put to it, and that to me, you know, is you know me, you know, is a, is a sign that you know that it is it's become everything that it you know that it possibly could. But this that last performance last night was, you know, was radiant, uh, and you know it was tremendous. Before James answers. When we got together on a week ago, Saturday, my tempos were a little sluggish, if you will, slow, actually. 
They were kind of what was marked, but not quite. I was always, and if I'm going to be in error, it's always going to be I'm going to be too slow. My art's just me. And I, I just don't want to go to the next note until I absolutely have to, because I'm enjoying this one so much. <laughs> you know? um, I just don't want to let it go. And so I will say that my, t my timing of the piece, which I'm very careful about, and it comes from my time when I was flying intercontinentally 15 or 20 hours and then getting off a plane and conducting an opera that evening of four hours, or sometimes if it was de Valcure, over five hours. And I needed to know how jet lag was affecting my tempos or my impressions of time or passage of time. So anyway, so mm. I got it. I was very proud because James kept saying, it's got to be less than 35, around 35, something like that. And, and so I timed it at home. I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm timing it. And I, it's, it's like 34 and change, you know? And this inevitability has to do with flow and consciousness and friendliness and understanding when the piece can move forward and when it needs to kind of hold back because it's been mentioned, it's, it exists in time. And it's not time that's a mysterious, it's your time. It's our time. It's your, it's your existence. It's your moments of life. You know, it's, it's time in that moment is a really important thing. And how music affects your awareness and acknowledgement of that time has to do with whether you are receiving nourishment or you're just eating cotton candy. And so it's really crucial, this idea of timing. And so I will say that once we got to Thursday night, after the Sunday, re Sunday rehearsal, Tuesday and Wednesday rehearsal, my timings never, never varied more than one minute. In a 30, it ended up being 33 minutes and up to 30, 34 minutes and change. And, and so it did become more, I think, formulated, at least for this week. Mm -hmm. If I reapproach re it, it might do this or do that, but it won't, won't vary very much. And mm -hmm. I, I noticed that my timings in 1999, the last time I did Toten für Klärung, Death and Transfiguration, which was 25 minutes and 44 seconds. That was in ninth, April of 1999. In this particular week, it was 25 minutes and 34 seconds. So, I mean, once something gets ingrained in you, it doesn't, it, when you realize that's really what it should be, it becomes like a, an etched, mm -hmm. etched artistic. Mm -hmm. So James, as, as you are very likely to conduct this work, mm -hmm. I mean, I hope, I, hope I, I left some positive impressions, but I mean, you're probably, the next performance of this will probably be something that you conduct. And, and then also this week, you're composing a concerto for orchestra, as you said, and a core work. How might you take this experience forward mm -hmm. so it's just not an isolated moment mm -hmm. in your life? Well, I've learned a, a lot this week uh, on a, a number of different levels. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm writing music. I've spent a lot of music time writing this week. And the experience of hearing you rehearse and perform uh, has actually gone into the piece. Uh, I've found myself more at, at ease with um, long sections of orchestral music in the in the concerto for orchestra where I feel I can open things up a bit, allow the music to breathe, um, uh, not just that way, but this way, if that means anything. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm thinking about how the orchestration can, can fill the, the spaces, uh, the musical spaces, the different um, uh, p um, harmonics uh, of sound that can be excited into shape. So I, I'm, I've, I've been worrying over a low G in the orchestra, just the note G for a long time. And how am I going to, is that, is that a tuba note? Or is that a contrabassoon note? Uh, double basses? Well, it's all of these things, but it's this huge spectrum of extra notes has, has emerged from it. And that's from just from hearing you work those first few bars, which is all about uh, the harmonics series and harmo harmonic set spectrum. So I, I have found the music I've been writing even when I've been here in California, to, be a, to have been affected by watching you and observing you. And also, as you say, um, I watch conductors like, like a hawk uh, because I can learn so much from you. Uh, I've always done that. I've always loved being at uh, other conductors' rehearsals to see their rehearsal technique, to see how the musicians respond to you, to see how you manage your time, to see how you, what, what you do to rehearse to make things better. 
um, to how you sh how you shape a, a, a structure of a piece of music. So uh, that's been a huge lesson, not just one lesson, three or four lessons, uh, <laughs> conducting lessons I've had this week. And it'll all go into the mix uh, so that when I do come to conduct this, and I've been in contact with my agents and my publishers a lot this week saying, I want to do this piece with this orchestra in the UK or wherever, uh, can you try and organise it? Uh, so if you get sick, you know who to call, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, br I brought my, my baton with me just in case of this. Yeah, so I, and likewise, he was ready to fill in if I got, you know. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I just want to ask you one more question because our, the first composer in residence of the Pacific Symphony was Frank De Kelly. He just retired as professor of composition at USC. He's a wonderful friend. I've known him since he was a doctoral student when I was, we're not so different in age, but I was, they took a big risk on me at the University of Michigan and hired me when I was 26 years old there. And, and he was working on his doctorate. And his teacher, one of his teachers, Bill Balkum was one of them, but also Leslie Bassett. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he was charged with writing, uh, bringing in some orchestral work for the you know, next lesson. And he went in with a blank piece of manuscript paper. He says, Dr. Bassett, I just don't like, like Dana. I don't know where to start. I can't put anything down. And Leslie goes, how about the, letter, how about the note B? <laughs> <laughs> so it starts with B. The first piece he wrote with B starts with B. And this piece also serendipitously starts Mm -hmm. <laughs> <With> B. <laughs> anyway, how do you put the first note down? I mean, that first note, it's like, it's like a baby's first step or mama or, you know, what's, or in, on Father's Day, it should be dada, I'm sure. But mm. how, how, how did you find that B? Well, it's... It is B. Yes, it is. Yeah. But uh, then it, it goes uh, into quarter tones and... Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the whole point of the opening uh, uh, section of the piece is about the creation of the world, the creation of the universe, the creation of the creation. And, and what, what a responsibility for a composer to respond. <laughs> How does one do that? Well, Haydn has done it, of course, and there are many other composers, but that, this is my creation moment. So how, how do I recreate that? And it's also connected with uh, the, the, that moment in the text where the two solos sing, and, and then God said. And uh, I wanted to find something that was representative of the mystery of God's act of love of creation. And you're right, the first, the first bar is silence, but from that silence comes this very, very mysterious sound. And it's, it, wasn't much, it wasn't actually pitches that were first and foremost in my mind. It was a kind of color, a color of the beginning of something. A shimmer. A shimmer, uh, and, and, and that's where all these harmonic series comes in. This, the cellos are going up and down their G string. B is important, it's in there, of course, but there's a whole spectrum of extra notes, a lot of quarter tones, uh, et cetera, as you've got the har harmonic spectrum, and it's all there. Uh, and it's a, it's a mysterious ur moment, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it wasn't a surprise to me that uh, I, one of the very next things that happened was this kind of Das Rheingold moment, which, uh, I mean, ba Wagner has this low E flat at the beginning of the ring, which is, and he's creating his own uh, creation myth from that. I, I go one, if not better, certainly lower. Uh, and, <laughs> yes, you do, yes, you do. My low <laughs> note, my uh, ur pitch, as it were, is a C sharp. C -sharp. And um, I, I was just astonished at the first rehearsal when I heard the organ pedo, 32 feet, foot C sharp, and the double basses doing that tremolando. And um, it, it made, made the hairs in the back of the neck really sort of uh, tingle. Uh, so I'm very proud of the, the beginning of that, that piece. It was more, more a sound and a color rather than a note. I, I want to, before, I, 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 I don't want to belabor all of this, but I want to point out um, that such a program, which is called Cathedrals of Sound, if it were in the hands of a librettist, a poet, and a composer, and a conductor, who weren't not only spiritual, but religious, 
this whole presentation of this week's program would have felt very different. I can promise you that. Um, so I'm going to come back mm -hmm. to, if you haven't listened to it, you have to. It's several recordings on YouTube. It's the seven last words from the cross. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have 44 minutes, just listen to the sixth and seventh movement. And James, when you say, I didn't count how many times it is finished, it is finished, it is finished with the Sopranos talking about the blind, that the person who consoled me, he was not near, and all of you consider my sorrow, mm -hmm. and it, it is finished. It is finished. And just before that, you could literally, I mean, it's for strings and choir, no soloists. You can hear the spikes in the strings. The mm -hmm. You could hear the pangs or spikes, or I'm not sure what you're intended, but I know how I took it. Mm -hmm. And then in the, the top of the, the very, it just fades, it's finished. And then the first note of the last movement is the word father. Father, and you repeat that. Then you say, of course, I can end. When I heard that for the first time, I felt that pain. I want to go back to my very first question. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to find those notes? Well, um, I, I think yeah, it, it, it's a tricky question. You know, I get asked. I don't mean about to be it. tricky. About it. Uh, I get no. I get asked it a lot uh, because I, I realise it is a very emotional piece, and it's a piece that affects a lot of people in a profound way. And uh, the, these things happen by accident sometimes. Um, I, I think we, we become vessels for something else. You, you're right about that. There's I, no I accident see, here. There's that. no accidents here. Um, but you know the. There has to be a degree of detachment on the part of the composer in writing a sad piece of music. Mm. Um, one has to control the drama, control the tragedy, um, no matter who, who, what it is you're writing about. And that was the same with, uh, with the Seven Last Words. I think um, the, the, the true experience of, of writing a piece like that comes from my experience of liturgy, which is a kind of stylized, especially the Good Friday liturgy, it's a kind of stylized uh, representation of tragedy, but put into ritual form. And I suppose that's what music can be. It can express the deep uh, depths of the abyss, uh, emotional abyss, um, the death of Christ, the torture of Christ and on the cross. One has to step up to the abyss sometimes as artists uh, to look into it in order to rede redeem it. Uh, Pope John Paul II wrote this amazing letter to the artists of the world uh, where he said that you, you, some of you, and it wasn't just to the Catholic artists of the world like us, it was to everyone, all the, all, all the artists of the world, where he recognized that there was a, a, a great search, a universal search amongst those artists for redemption. And even when they were far from the church, far from orthodoxy, if you like, uh, when they step up to the abyss, as in, as in the case of many, many uh, of the, the great artists of the world, it's in that desire to redeem what is in the abyss. Uh, and that is, that is part of the act of creation. It's part, we are a kind of echo of the, uh, the, the, not just the creation story, but the, 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 res, the crucifixion narrative as well. Thank you for that. You know, during COVID times, I was teaching. We, most of us, did a lot of Zooming, teaching, professing. I had 126 students literally all over the world every Friday for two hours. And it came to my mind that, especially for young people who are seeking what I don't even know how to characterize what they're seeking, but they're seeking. And I just wanted to remind them that, you know, that probably the most important currency they have is time. And that the difficulty with it is, is that you don't know how much you got in your bank account. 
and that we need to really be mindful of that. And I hope that the time that we've spent together this afternoon has enriched your bank account, has made you feel that it was, as Dana said, worthy. And uh, all of us, especially these two gentlemen, would love to hear your thoughts, your, entertain your questions, anything that you might want. Um, can we go, this gentleman has a microphone, and then we'll come right over. So thank you, all three of you. We went on Thursday and, and heard the piece, and it was a very special experience for our family and many of our friends that, that came along, people from our community and our children's community. Uh, my question is for James. I know that, Dana, California is in your bones, and it, it's, it's part of your poetry because it's obviously it's a part of who you are and where you've lived your whole life. Uh, but James, I think it was, it was just before the performance, you mentioned, uh, because we were talking about the fact that this piece was for the rededication of the Christ Cathedral, which is important to Orange County, you know, historically for both Protestants and Catholics now, actually, interestingly enough. Um, and I, I wonder, because you're not from here, mm -hmm. and the, the building that was being rededicated is something that you've probably only seen a handful of times, I would imagine, on visits here. How did either that place or California itself influence this piece mm -hmm. for you? You, you mentioned this was a, a love letter to the people of the United States and that you were fond of this country and this land. And I think the, the audience was very moved by that remark. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, as someone from a very different place, mm. um, English speaking, obviously, share, a lot of shared history and a lot of shared culture. Mm -hmm. Is there something distinctive about Orange County, California, or about the former Crystal Cathedral, now Christ Cathedral, that um, found its way into this music? Well, all of those things, most definitely. But the binding ingredient was uh, Dana's poetic response to the place uh, in writing a, a, a text that was about the consecration of a sacred space. And there, there, are, there are examples in musical history of um, composers doing just that, either liturgically or you know, the Beethoven uh, overture and so on. Uh, music is a, a perfect medium to consecrate spaces. And, and Carol said, uh, on various occasions this week that the, the place that was being consecrated this week was in fact the hall, was it the, the concert hall. It became our sacred space for that evening and uh, the music uh, uh, in, the many, in the many different ways was, was an exploration of the sacred. And um, Dana, Dana's poetry highlights this uh, and then becomes very site spe specific, if you like, towards the end, and it talks about this land of quake and fire, and it references the, the Crystal Cathedral uh, and the light in the place. Uh, and I, I, I was delighted to, to, to engage with that degree of localism, knowing that a Californian audience would see something of themselves being reflected back at them, via Scotland, of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gentleman right here who had, there's a microphone right behind you. All right, I want to let you, I just want to let you know there's, I'm overwhelmed right now with a lot of impressions from this that was, I wrote a lot myself and it, there's a lot in my head that I haven't been able to write yet, but I will. But I have to pick one. <laughs> and so along the idea of time, uh, Sir James, you had talked about how you started with the text. And in the text, I see there's an idea that I think it was St. Augustine that said something about uh, that time is the elongation of the eternal now. And I've really been thinking about that a lot for the last few months. In your text, you elongate let there be light for me in a really powerful way because you take it all the way out to the light of the world. And then musically, and this is where my question is gonna come up, Musically, I feel like you took that moment that I've often thought of as the light turning on and you elongated that moment and carried it. And there were things in there that I never thought about before. And what hit me the most actually was the physics of it, the physics of the creation of light, 
which really involves the creation of time and physics and everything else. So I just kind of wondered if you, in somewhere in your meditations, had thought about the physics of it. How, how deep did you go, if you went there? Because I can tell you, for me, I was seeing the whole electromagnetic spectrum. I was getting a major visual that was incredible, and the process. Well, there's something about music when it engages with time, and indeed the, the setting of text associated with, uh, with time, uh, that can explode our time. It, be, it becomes, time becomes fluid. Uh, you can bend time in a piece of music. Um, there's this wonderful piece by Olivier Messier on quartet for the end of time. Um, and composers, I suppose, even s subconsciously and subliminally are, are obsessed with time. And because tri time can play tricks on us in music, and time can play tricks on us in, the mat in matters of the spirit. God's time is not our time uh, in that sense, and, and even liturgical time, when we enter into the, the divine praises of the church, we're entering into a, a collaboration with the, um, the assembled forces of heaven, uh, saints and angels, who are in a very different place and time, but we become one with them. And maybe music has to deal with that, engage with it, and get, get down to the issue of how to stretch time to God's own perspective. But I'd be very interested to hear what Dana thought about that, because I, I did repeat that phrase, well, those phrases, a lot. <laughs> uh, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, if you th think of it, and I, I think of it in a way as seen through the Kabbalah, you know, which is that what you're seeing in that moment is the metaphysical realm creating the physical realm, the eternal creating a subset of it, which is temporal. And so God's word uh, is a word that is eternal. It's omnipotent. Uh, it is infinite. And we can only hear it as a sliver of finite material temporal existence. And so the juncture of that struck, struck me as extremely interesting. And it's the, the subject of a lot of, of, of Christian and Jewish mysticism. And I think that's exactly, I was surprised at how it turned out the music, but I was delighted because, you know, it's, it cannot be, you know, fiat, Luke's cannot be summarized as Luke's, you know, because light in God's mouth is different than light in the human mouth. And it seemed to me that you create this thing that was this vast swirling shape, you know, sort of, oops, coming up from the bottom. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is, you know, you, you try to recreate a kind of mystical moment in, in music. Just wanted to point out is when he says, well, I repeated it, you know, quite a few times. He didn't repeat it ever. It was different every time. And, and that subtle difference, and if you notice that it took quite a while for Let There Be Light to, which began in the, the basses and the baritones, yeah. uh, way down on the low E's, and, the, and the, before it got to the sopranos, you know, three and a half octaves higher, you know, when they said, or when they sang, Let There Be Light. So even in that itself, there was light appearing in front of your very eyes just over a long period of time, and that just doesn't, there's no accidents. He says this, some things happen. I don't think this is not an accident. He understood exactly what from that low pedal C sharp that he, that he referred to. And, and so light was appearing. My question to James, um, when we had a rehearsal, and I asked again the other night, let there be light. I said, is it a question? Is it a plea or, or a statement? And when I was working with the Pacific Chorale, we sang it as a statement, and then we sang it as a plea or as a be someone beseeching someone. And then he had even the most mo more profound answer, which was, when God, when, when God said, when God says, "Let there be light," it's it's everything. It's neither. It's both. It's all encompassing. Mm -hmm. it, it's not just. Let there be light. It's it's not so simply, uh, you know, d d defined. Yes, sir. 
I'm really curious to know um, how your background as Christians affects your sense of what you're up to in the creative process. You know, are you offering something to God? Do you, do you feel you're somehow like joining him in the labors of creation? Like Tolkien had this idea of man, the sub-creator. Are you trying to reflect something about him? How, how would you answer that? I, I would imagine somehow your Christian worldview would affect your sense of your your purpose and the activity of creating. And I'd just love to hear what you'd say. I'll just start because mine's quick. God gave me a talent. That was his gift to me. I got my gift to back to God is how I use it and in which manner and for whom and how often. You, you, okay. okay. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated question. I, I think I would resist the very simple notion that somehow writing the poem is the prayer, or writing the music is a prayer. What's happening is that you have in your own life, in your own spiritual life, established a relationship with the a divine, a posture of the, for the d divine. And I've, uh, when I was trained early as a poet, you know, they were always told about, you know, you're creating a universe in your work, you're, you know, you're doing all these things, which is sort of a half truth. What you're doing is, I think, is you're recognizing some tiny scintillating uh, fragment of creation, and you're trying to reflect the light of that moment. And the creation of it is to create delight or sadness or whatever it is, but it's the, it's the posture of, of your life coming into that creation in which I think, uh, you know, your, your my, in my case, my Catholicism comes in it, as well as the, I'm very concerned as a poet, and it, it exists, I think, too, too, in music, where you say something that's very resonant, the audience loves, and it's a lie. Uh, you know, it's bullshit. Uh, happy horseshit, as, as they used to say it in the, in the sales force. Uh, and and you, to, to say something which is, uh, Dante defines poetry as saying things that are true in words that are beautiful. And I think you have to have both portions. You have to have the beauty which you participate from the divine creation and the truth which is your ability to recognize you know, that versus taking something that's easy or popular or whatever. I'd say it's quite a, a difficult question to answer, but it, it might be best to refer to something that was uh, spoken about right at the very beginning of, of this talk. Um, when I, the day I wanted to become a composer, I was a child. Um, th therefore, I associate my composerliness with something very childish. Um, childlike, uh, and I began m m that life in music when I was hearing the Bible stories for the first time. You know, I, I, I have a childlike memory, happy memories of my first engagements with religion. I got my religion from not just my parents and grandparents, but from my community, uh, from friends, but even bef through them, back through history. Um, it's been a, 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 a gift that has been handed on through history, through time, uh, but received as a child, as many, many people do receive it. Um, and for me, the compositional instinct uh, has to keep alive that uh, childhood experience. To, to me, the child has to be alive in, in the compositional desire. I haven't changed as a composer since I was eight years old. I'm still the same person that was obsessed with these things when I was a little boy. Uh, and and that, that was a little boy that was made very happy by Bible stories and the way that my mum and my dad used to tell them to me. And um, so they're, for me, they're all in interconnected. Um, you'd mentioned that um uh, a libretto is used in this piece, which I associate with, with drama, opera, oratorio. Um, is that, so is the, is the piece indeed dramatic in any way? And, and are there characters? And if, if 
you know, Dana and James, if, you, uh, if it is indeed that, you know, a dramatic element, um, how did you approach it uh, and your contribu contributions to it? I, I conceived of the piece as a sort of spiritual narrative. It, it, it's a very simple structure. Uh, I, I thought of it as liturgical uh, because it was going to be performed in the cathedral and, and you know, Catholics insist that what you're doing in a cathedral has something to do with the faith. Uh, bingo is played in the parish hall. Uh, <laughs> the, and, and so I started, we had agreed with this notion that since it was, a, it was being inspired by the cathedral, what makes the, the crystal cathedral, Christ cathedral different from, I was in the, the, the Cologne cathedral a few years ago, which is vast and magnificent, but rather dark. Very the Crystal good. Cathedral is, you, you know, you are suffused with light. So we use that as the metaphor, which led us to the creation. So the pieces have very simple structure. Uh, there are, I begin with the Old Testament. You know, some of the best lines are written by Mo Moses uh, and translated by St. Jerome, because I use the Vulgate uh, in, in, in the Latin portion of it. And then, so there's the creation of the world, and then I have a celebration of, of creation of the natural world and what light allows us to see. That's what the litany of light is. And it goes everything from the stars and the moon to the human eye. Uh, and uh, then brings us back to the rhyme of choir and spire, which is, you know, brings you back to the Crystal Cathedral. And then I, take you know, uh, a, a brief quotation from the New Testament, you are the light of the world, uh, the, you know, uh, and this, the, you know, the city shining on the hill cannot be hid. And I then take that light and turn it into the light of Christianity. Uh, and the church, you know, which is the city on the hill, you know, which is, if, if a city can't be hid, it, it's, both that it's there inspiring, but it's also vulnerable. It can be attacked by anybody, and that's what Christians have to accept. And I take you know, the New Testament version of that embodied uh, by the symbol of the church as the symbol of, of Christi the Christians gathered together in worship. And then I end up with the hymn, uh, you know, you know, which I call Cathedral of Light, which is very, once again, California Pacific. Uh, upon this rock, our cross and spire, built in a land quake of quake and fire, uh, and fragile as glass. So the word fragile, which Jimmy does magical things with, uh, bright as uh, as the air, the slanted walls folded in prayer. And so I, and I bring it right back to the cathedral. But every architectural, physical feature of the cathedral, I try to give a metaphysical and a Christian meaning. Uh, and also reflect the precariousness of Christianity, uh, not just in the, the fragility of a glass cathedral in Earthquake Central, but also <laughs> the fragility of, of Christianity in California today, uh, in which I think you know, we have to witness it uh, to people who May, you know, may not may not uh, think well of it. Yes, very briefly, there are different librettos doing different things. There are diff librettos can do very different things, and and um, <clears throat> some libretti are are dramatic and for dramatic purposes, like opera. And I, I've had some experience of opera. I've I've worked with poets and librettists who have given me text for um, dramatic theatrical. Um, expression. Uh, this, this is different, uh, as Dana, I think, has pointed out. However, there's something about um, the experience of having written music for theatre that goes into the bloodstream. And um, I, I, on, on hearing the, the work this week, I, I've, I've been struck about just how dramatic it is uh, at moments. Yes, it has a ritualistic um, quality, of course, but there's, there is great drama in it. And maybe that's come from my own experience of opera and, and having worked with, um, with theatrical forms in the past. 
I think you could summarize the narrative by saying it goes from the beginning of the world to Orange County, California. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for your attentiveness and for allowing us to, to be with you this afternoon. See if I can knock anything else over. I just, I just have to say that the work that many of us in this room heard this week, and some will hear on Tuesday night, um, wouldn't have happened without these three men, and without Robert Eisted, who um, could not come, who is the director of the Pacific Corral. And our but, two soloists as well. Almost and the two Johnson. soloists, very true. Um, but it is what it is, and we've gotten to hear, I don't know about you, but I love this afternoon. Um, we've gotten to learn more about how that came to be. And I just, First of all, I want to thank you, because I had this crazy idea. And look at this. It's awesome. But it took, well, it took the three of you. And I thank you. Thank you, Roberta. And, and it took you. It also took Howard. So, yes. yes. I want to point out one thing, um, a week, which is that the show, which is up in our art gallery um, by Maya Lisa Engelhart, The Eight Days of Creation, has a lot to do with Fiat Lukes. And in fact, she has paintings that are Fiat Lukes in the show. And Maya and Peter are here. I, I can't see them where they, right there. Um, and also, yes, uh, by and Peter. And next week, we had to work this all together because I wanted Maya and Peter uh, to hear the, the, the um, oratorio, and also we needed to open her show, so it's a double header one week after the other. Um, next, next week will be the opening opening of Maya's show of the eight days of creation. There will be a film um, about Maya's work in which you will hear Maya. And then uh, Monsignor Timothy Verdon, who's floating around here somewhere, right there, who is the director of the Duomo Museum, is going to give us a talk about art, about visual art. It's its history, about which he knows a very great deal, and, uh, and how it comes into the present. And so, um, so I invite you all to come. It's kind of the second verse. It's the visual verse of, of, what, of what we've heard tonight. But I don't know. This was pretty incredible for me. So, um, and next week I'll tell you about what's coming up in the fall. There's a lot happening um, in the fall. But um, I think we should just close now, because this was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.